Welcome. Grab your favorite morning beverage and join us for Morning Cannolis with Jim Santel. You don't know me, but I'm your brother. Sampling the news desserts of the week, here is your host, Jim Santel. Good morning. This is Jim Santel. This is Morning Cannolis. We're at the WAUK radio station here in downtown Waukesha. It is a beautiful Saturday morning. We're also celebrating here in Waukesha this morning. Throughout the afternoon as well, this is Waukesha Unlocked, an opportunity for you to visit Waukesha. It's many businesses, commercial spaces, places of enjoyment, places of entertainment, including right here at the studios, WAUK radio, the Shaw in downtown Waukesha. Come by, visit Don Brown, my friend, my colleague, my predecessor right here this morning is going to remain here in the studio to take your visits and to be a part of our special celebration of Waukesha this morning. Waukesha Unlocked this morning through the afternoon and also tomorrow as well. A time to get to know Waukesha, to revel in all the good things that are this wonderful city, to revel in all the good things that are the state of Wisconsin as well, which we're going to chat about during the course of the morning and beyond. Tomorrow as well, live broadcasting from right here in the studios of WAUK Waukesha right here in downtown Waukesha. We're taking your phone calls as always at 844-967-2789. I'm here in those studios with my producer Calvin who will monitor and get your calls and your thoughts, your perspectives on the radio into me so that we can chat about all those good issues. As always, we're not just sampling the news desserts of the week. We're focusing today and in the future on significant stories. This past week in law and government and the aspiration for justice in America. As always, right here on 101 FM, 540 AM, we have an aggressive but achievable syllabus and academic curriculum this morning that is going to keep you attentive and much engaged. So do call in and offer your comments, your questions along the way. We're going to start, of course, as we always do with some Today in History comments, some very significant things happening in history on October 8th in our world world in our nation. Then we're going to go back and revisit a couple of issues we have chatted about in previous programs, and that is pardons in America, some updating news just this past week related to the current president's granting of pardons, some clemency that again affect who we are as a nation, what we're going to be doing with respect to our international partners as well. We're going to do some updates as well on what's going on with the Mar-a-Lago investigation, some events just in the past 48 hours or so that everyone should be attentive to as that investigation proceeds. And then, and then, most of our time this morning, specifically during the second hour today on Morning Cannolis, going to be focusing once again on the United States Supreme Supreme Court. Our United States Supreme Court, first Monday in October, just this past Monday, the first day of its new term, the 2022-2023 term. We chatted last week about some of the initial cases that were on the docket of the court for oral argument this past week. We're going to revisit those just a little bit and do a bit of a summary on what the Supreme Court justices said, how they responded to the arguments of the parties this past week. And then we're also going to chat about some additional cases coming up as soon as next week and in the times ahead. A bit of a teaser here at the start of our first hour as well. One of those cases we're going to talk about, not yet scheduled for oral argument, but has to do with the future of elections in America. I'll offer to you that it is from my perspective and the view of many people that this is perhaps the most single, most important case the Supreme Court will be addressing in our lifetime, as significant as all those cases were in the last term. This one has to do with who decides who wins, who decides the rules, the laws, the principles, procedures for voting in America, the Supreme Court taking up an issue related to the role of legislatures and courts in America, one of the most significant cases on its docket this term. Stay tuned for our discussion this morning about that case as well. Well, this is Morning Cannolis again, law, government, the aspiration for justice in America. Let us begin. Let us begin here on Civic Media as we celebrate Waukesha Unlocked. This is our 16th show of the series. Let's begin by looking at what happened today in history, October 8th. It is the 281st day of this calendar year. 
84 days remaining, and just a little bit over 30 days, 30 days over from the uh, midterm elections, as Don in his program just concluded uh, with her, his guest, Kristen Hansen, focusing on the important role of voting and elections and the necessity for each one of us to be out there and engaging in elective politics, whether it's campaigning, whether it's simply voting. If anyone chooses not to vote, uh, they virtually give up the right to complain down the road. So vote. Vote uh, this coming election. Vote in all elections because it, it, the future of our republic quite literally depends upon your participation in what we do on in early November and on all other voting days of this year. Let's talk about the past before we talk about the future more. October 8th, 1871. 1871, October 8th, today in 18. 18- 1871 was the day that the O'Leary Barn was much in the news of the area and of the nation. The Great Chicago Fire began today on 1871. Two days later, 300 people were killed. A large swath of the city was destroyed in that Great Chicago Fire. And of course, all of us in Wisconsin are very much aware of the fact that here in Wisconsin, on that same day, 1871, October 8th, our own city of Peshtigo burned to the ground uh, in virtually hours, killing uh, well over 1,100 people right here in Wisconsin, uh, two significant catastrophic events in the history of our nation, both today, October 8th, uh, 1871. Other significant events on this day in history, 1970, Alexander Solzhenitsyn was awarded the Nobel Prize. You may recall him, uh, the author, the tremendous author of the Gulag Archipelago, Cancer, Cancer Ward, one day in the life of uh, Ivan Denisovich, um, a, a major, major character, not only in the literature of our world, but also in understanding the Soviet Union, the history of Russia, and to this day, a necessary reading for all of us to understand what our nation, our world is all about. Very significant today in 1970, he is awarded the uh, Nobel Prize. Today in 1936, October 8th, 1936, Hoover Dam, at that time known as B- a Boulder Dam, began generating electricity. Much in the news today because, as you know, Lake Mead at record, record low levels because of the drought in Arizona, in Nevada, other places in the West. Because of that drought, Lake Mead at dramatically low levels right now. Concern about whether it will continue to uh, generate electricity for the southwestern portion of our nation. But today, on October 8th, 1936, Hoover Dam goes into operation for the first time. Today, in 1973, was the day that Vice President Spiro Agnew resigned. He pled guilty, pled no contest, not contesting the allegation against him. It had to do with his time as Maryland governor. He pled guilty to income tax evasion and obviously then resigned his vice presidency not too long after that, as we know well. The president, Richard Nixon, also resigned for very different reasons in the midst and the wake of the Watergate scandal as well. Um, October 8th of this day in history, 1982, another significant event in world history. In Poland, in Poland, the Polish legislature dissolved the trade union known as Solidarity. You may recall that name well. It was this underground organization initially led by Alek Walesa and eventually becomes an above ground enterprise to end the communist rule in Poland. Lekulesa goes on to become one of the great leaders of that nation, a huge issue in Polish history and for the history of our nation as well, across the world as well. 1990, an issue that brings us in many ways to our discussion in the second hour today. David Souter, one of four living former Supreme Court justices. David Souter, however, in 1990, took his seat as a Supreme Court justice. He was in that position from 1990 to 2009, nominated, confirmed by the Senate, nominated by President George Bush, and eventually retired, uh, not with great things to say about Washington, D.C. and about his experiences there, but remains remains a very significant voice, as do all the other Supreme Court justices, Sandra Day O'Connor and others, who talk about civics a lot, as we do 
here on this program. David Souter, 1990, taking his role, his position on the United States Supreme Court. 2004 was the day, October 8th, that Martha Stewart reported to federal prison in West Virginia after pleading guilty to insider trading. She served five months in federal prison, began that service on uh, today, October 8th of 2004. Uh, 2005 in Pakistan, 79,000 people were killed in an earthquake in the Kashmir region in Pakistan on this day in 2000, uh, in 2005 on this day. And in 2012, another horrific but ultimately re- life reaffirming event. 2012, today was the day that 15-year-old Pakistani art, um, artist Malala Yousafzai um, was shot by the Taliban gunman uh, in that nation. He was, she was a vocal opponent of Taliban's prohibition on the education of girls and other rights for women uh, in, in that country. Um, she was shot on this day, of course, survived and became an international activist. Uh, to this day, a very strong advocate and a voice piece for all good things, not only with respect to girls and women, but civil liberties and civil justice as well. So many, many things happening, happening on October 8th in the history of our nation. We remember those things because we should, as always, work on the future and recall that the best indicator of our future sometimes is our past. And if we do not learn from our past, we are doomed to repeat some of the tragedies of the past. We hopefully, hopefully in our future, both here in this nation and around the world, build on the good things that people who are advocates for civil rights, uh, human rights, justice in America, justice around the world are advocating for. And that's what our discussion is about this morning as well. And so lots of things going on on October 8th, including right here, October 8th, 2022, right here in downtown Waukesha, Waukesha Unlocked, once again, inviting you to visit us at the studio here of WAUK Radio right on Wisconsin Avenue here from 10 in the morning starting in a little less than an hour from now and continuing throughout the day until the later afternoon many opportunities throughout the city of Waukesha to visit this wonderful place to be a part of Wisconsin to be a part of the United States of America and to revel in all the good things that we are in this nation I promised right before the break that we would talk uh, about the uh, significant developments in the areas of Mar-a-Lago. And we're going to be doing that right after this break. Uh, Come back, join us here at at Morning Cannolis as we chat more about significant events in the history of our nation. Current events today right here on WAUK Radio. And we're back. This is Jim Santel. Thank you so much for joining me on this bright and beautiful morning in Waukesha, in the state of Wisconsin, and throughout our nation, October 8th, 2022. Right before the break, I did indicate what our syllabus is. It is, once again, aggressive, but achievable. We're going to be chatting for a few moments this morning in this hour about two topics that have been on our discussion agendas previously. One of those related to the continuing focus on the investigation of the seizure the search and seizure at Mar-a-Lago, the documents, classified documents there, 11,000 items seized by the FBI in early August. What's the status of that? What has happened just in the past 24, 48, 36 hours out here in connection with that investigation? We're going to chat about that in just a moment. And then we're going to revisit our previous discussion about pardons, because once again, just this past week, pardons resurfaced as a significant constitutional issue in America, not without its consequences. Controversy, a set of pardons, actually two sets of pardons, that were issued by President Biden in this past week. As you recall, we spent a lot of time talking about the authority to do that and the history of pardons, those issued by former President Trump during his term. We're going to compare those to some things that the present president, President Trump, did this past week under the Constitution of the United States 
of America. But before we get to that, let's talk once again about Mar-a-Lago. We will recall well that in early August, the FBI, based upon the execution of a search warrant by a magistrate judge named Bruce Reinhardt, a federal judge in South Florida, authorized the execution of a warrant at Mar-a-Lago, this residence and office of the former president, uh, on the belief, on the probable cause to believe that there were, in fact, evidence of crime there at the Mar-a-Lago location documents that should not have been there in violation of at least three, if not more, federal statutes, classified materials to be sure, but also documents that should not have been taken from the White House under the Presidential Records Act. The National Archives looking for them, and looking for them to this day, we found out just last night. The National Archives telling us that even after all of the litigation about that search and the efforts by the Department of Justice to investigate, the responses by the former president and his staff, the engagement by federal judges now increasing in numbers by the day as all of that is happening as late as last night. The National Archives archives still saying that we have not yet gotten everything we should have gotten based upon our understanding of the records, the traditional things that come from a president after he, perhaps one day she, is in the White House. So that is the the complete update. But along the way, in the past several days, some other activity. We know that this Judge Raymond Deary, appointed by Judge Eileen Cannon, the federal district court judge, she appointed Raymond Deary to serve as his special master. And he has been going through these 11,000 documents, 11,000 items trying to parse through these issues about attorney-client privilege in particular and executive privilege also raised by the former president and his attorneys. And just last night, issuing some additional orders as he continues that work with respect to figuring out what those documents are all about, asking, as he has done before, for the president's attorneys to advise him, to give him pleadings, to place in writing in the record of the case information about the president's position on things like executive privilege, frankly, an issue that typically is not resolved at this time, nor is any of this for what that is worth, but attempting once again to follow through on Judge Cannon's directives to him to get his hands around what these documents are all about. Significant, as we have talked before, that in the past, in the past, the magistrate judge, Bruce Reinhardt, already commissioned a a review team, a, a sometimes called a, a privilege review team, to look through all these documents and determine whether or not they are subject to attorney-client privilege, anything else about them that would be appropriate to return to the president. So that initiative under the direction of Judge Deary is still going on, perhaps more significantly, even as that is happening. You recall well that the 11th Circuit uh, a couple of weeks ago issued what can only be gar- regarded as a strong rebuke of Judge Cannon in South Florida, telling her that her initial involvement in this matter is probably unwise, it is unjustified, it is unsupported by the law, and giving the Department of Justice access to about 100 documents that are in the nature of, of classified materials, secret, top secret, other things like that, so that they can continue the national security investigation of all of this. Uh, meanwhile, meanwhile, a couple of very significant things have happened just this past week. The Department of Justice, aggravated by all of this, undeniably, they don't say that out loud, but plenty of their pleadings indicate that. They have returned now to the 11th Circuit just this past week and have asked for an expedited review of their request for the complete overturning of Judge Cannon's orders. They want authority now to go ahead with respect to all of these documents that are in the possession and review by Judge Deary. I hope you're following all of this. It's not easy to, to follow, but there it is. The Department of Justice going back in to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals and asking that all all of this, in effect, be shut down. And they're asking for that expedited appeal. And in fact, the 11th Circuit, this three-judge panel that previously issued this order, finding that Judge Cannon had misstepped, had overstepped her bounds in doing what she had done, has granted that request for an expedited appeal. So we should anticipate that probably, perhaps as soon as next week, there could be yet another opinion from the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals on the future of all of this, all of this civil challenge to a criminal investigation, and uh, certain to be uh, consistent with his prior practice, the former president has yes gone to the United States Supreme Court now, just in the past 24 hours or so 
has asked the Supreme Court for an emergency application applied to them on an expedited basis, again, to review the 11th Circuit's opinion. And significantly, that matter has been given to the attention of the Circuit Justice. Uh, His name is Clarence Thomas. Clarence Thomas, he is assigned to be the Circuit Justice, and he, to his credit, has said, I will take a look at this, and has directed that the United States government, the U.S. Department of Justice, respond to the President's petition petition now before the Supreme Court, and to do it by Tuesday, October 11th. Expedited view on that, certainly an indication from both the Supreme Court and the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals that they're not waiting around. This is not going to be an extended um, aspect that they're going to be uh, pursuing here. And so an awful lot of reason, once again, to anticipate that we may get some very significant decisions out of the Supreme Court, perhaps shutting the president's emergency application down, uh, perhaps doing other things with respect to the 11th Circuit and the district court down there. The 11th Circuit also likely going to be issuing some orders here very soon, revisiting what it had, did, it had done before in connection with all of this. It's going to be a big week next week, so we're going to be taking a look at all of that when we come back again. Again next week and talk more about what's going on there. As I've said so many times before, all of this atypical, all of this regrettably a difficult lesson in history, not a good lesson in history, because as you know, as we have discussed before, all of this should be the subject of a criminal investigation, not civil litigation. We're going to chat more about those kinds of issues right after the break. We're going to return again to the issue of pardons right after the present break. Talk with you more about that constitutional requirement, responsibility, mandate of the president when he or she feels it's appropriate to grant pardons to people in America. Stay with us right here on WAUK Radio. This is Morning Cannolis. We're talking, as we always do in this time period, on WAUK Radio about government and justice and law in America. This morning is no exception. Thank you once again for joining me this morning in our remaining half an hour of this first hour of Morning Cannolis. We're going to talk about pardons once again. We began this discussion a couple of weeks ago with the Constitution of the United States of America, which does, in fact, vest in the presidency, the authority, the power to grant pardons to people under circumstances that are not explicitly described in the Constitution, but plainly the founders anticipated that that kind of exercise of power would be done, again, based upon justice and some sense of law, some sense of rightness, that after someone is convicted, after someone has, if you will, paid their debt to society, as people sometimes say, there's something about their life, the way in which they have turned themselves around, something about their contributions to the community, the ways in which they have lived their lives that warrants this special grace, if you will. And indeed, the United States Supreme Court has said that a grant of a pardon is an act of grace. It proceeds, as the United States Supreme Court said way back in 1833, from the power entrusted with the execution of the laws, that power obviously entrusted to the executive branch. It exempts the individual on whom it is bestowed from the punishment the law inflicts for a crime he has committed. That's the case of the United States versus Wilson way back in 1833, describing what pardons are all about, significant, packed inside that description, and also repeated in 1915 by that same, a later but same body, the same Supreme Court said that a pardon carries with it an acknowledgement, an imputation, a recognition of guilt. And that cannot be overstated. When you accept a pardon, you are saying, in effect, that I committed the crime for which I was convicted, for which there is a judgment entered against me, and I am asking the chief executive in this exercise of grace to grant me some special consideration because of factors that now warrant that special commutation, that special pardon, sometimes called clemency as well. And, of course, 
two ways of doing this, either effectively release, re, uh, releasing uh, that person from the burden of official records, that's a pardon, uh, not releasing you historically, not not erasing history, but removing the from the official records, the dockets, if you will, the conviction, the judgments against you, and enabling you to do all sorts of things that are otherwise impediments to your life and livelihood in the United States of America. A second option would be clemency, that is, the president reducing the amount of time that a person may be spending in prison under supervision, reducing their judgment to a certain level of time. Again, not erasing, if you will, that prior criminal judgment, but nonetheless having a significant impact upon that. And so that has been the history of pardons. Every president has engaged in this practice. It is virtually unchecked, which is a part of our point of our discussion of these past several weeks. And we've spent a lot of time talking about things that the past presidents have done. We focused in last uh, week's session on the pardons uh, issued by President Trump with respect to people like like Paul Manafort and Roger Stone and Michael Flynn and Joe Arpaio, the sheriff out in the west side of our nation. Uh, people like Rod Bogoyevich, Michael uh, Milken, the uh, stock uh, investor and defrauder. All those kinds of folks out there. We've talked about that in addition to Steve Bannon. And so we talked about many of those circumstances and also made reference along the way to equally significant and controversial pardons of past presidencies, including that of Bill Clinton. Many will recall Mark Rich, who died not too long ago, uh, several years ago, uh, pardoned by President Clinton uh, for his involvement in a uh, very significant uh, event uh, having to do with uh, financial wrongdoing and elections um, uh, uh, events uh, way back in the time of the uh, Clinton uh, era, uh, Mark Rich at the time called the King of Commodities, um, and uh, lots of controversy about that as well. So all presidents have done this, sometimes with great acclaim, appropriateness, sometimes with criticism. This past week, this past week, very significant that our current president, Joseph Biden, once again invoked the Section 2 of our Constitution and said, I'm going to issue some pardons this week. Again, typically, we know that chief executives issue these at the end of their terms as they're leaving office, but they can do it at any time that they care to do it. And indeed, presidents have done that. President Biden did it just this past week with respect to two sets of people. Let's talk about those two sets of people that the president pardoned this past week. Seven Americans, seven Americans have been held captive in Venezuela for years. They're on their way home. They're on their way home, and in fact, they arrived home uh, this past week just as we were going off the air last Saturday. News came that they were wending their way home after President Biden agreed to grant clemency to two nephews of Venezuela's first lady. Her name is Celia Florence, and the announcement was made that President Biden, to secure the return of these seven Americans who had been held captive in Venezuela for many, many years, he had agreed, he had agreed with the government of Venezuela to issue uh, clemency orders for two men who were sentenced in 2017, these two nephews of the Venezuelan first lady. They were sentenced to 18 years in prison for conspiring to smuggle cocaine into the United States of America. Undeniably, a deal made with Venezuela to commute, to reduce the sentences of those two convicted felons here in the United States of America in exchange for the release by Venezuela of our seven Americans now coming back and arrived back in the United States of America. Those two nephews, those two nephews, sometimes called the narco nephews, their names are Efren Antonio Campo Flores and Frankie Francisco Flores de Freitas, they were flown to a third country a week or so ago at the same time, at the same time that as a result of this arrangement, this agreement, this negotiation with the Venezuelan government, that a plane carrying our Americans landed in that same country, and the exchange was then made. Significantly, significantly, this matter, like many others, is drawing some criticism and praise both for the diplomacy engaged in with Venezuela, Venezuela to get our American citizens back into our nation, but also criticism for using the clemency power to accomplish this and releasing two folks, these uh, relatives of the First Lady, sending them back to their home country. Indeed, a senior Biden official, someone at the White House, called the president's action to grant clemency a, quote, a tough decision, 
a tough decision, even a painful decision, and remarked that this was the only way, the only way to persuade Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro, who is much in the news for many, many other reasons these days, to release those Americans. So a deal made, a deal made. The officials then declined to say whether the prisoner swap represented a thaw in the strained relationship that has existed for a long time now between the United States and the Maduro-led government in Venezuela. Uh, there have been sanctions imposed on the Maduro government and negotiations back and forth, ultimately leading to this deal, this arrangement by which President Biden granted clemency to these two individuals uh, spending time in our federal prisons for smuggling cocaine, their conspiracy in that kind of conduct. And we have gotten in exchange for that, the return of these seven Americans held captive for a very long time. Uh, And again, uh, not without criticism, not without praise and gratitude, certainly from the families of those seven Americans, but not without its criticism as well of the current president for exercising his constitutional opportunity, his authority, his power to do this just this past week and securing the return of those Americans to our nation. More recently, just in the past 48 hours or so, the president issued a great number of additional pardons. Let's talk about what those are, too. Those pardons, those pardons with respect to people convicted of marijuana possession under federal law law. Marijuana possession under federal law. We're going to chat about what those pardons are all about uh, in just a moment. But first, we're going to take some callers who are on the line right now. Let's let's take those callers, your observations, your comments, your questions, as we talk about pardons this morning. Once again, Dick from Madison. Dick, we appreciate your call in, uh, your comment, your question, your thought for us here on WAUK Radio. I think there's something else tied to the Venezuelan thing, too. We're saying if they'll start playing ball a little bit more, you know, the right way (laughs) as a country, that it's also tied to oil in that country. I just read an article about how the Biden administration would like to come up with some way to strike a deal to get some oil on the market for right. and, and, and exactly. I think, I think a lot of the commentary out there trying to understand how this happened, what happened, people who are praising it, people who are criticizing, acknowledging that we need to do something with respect to our relationship with Venezuela, uh, this significant international matter. And you may be exactly right that uh, this sort of, of of thawing, if you will, of the chill that has been out there, as you indicated, Dick, um, may be about, about energy and about oil and other opportunities to improve our very, very torn relationships with the Maduro government. I suspect you're absolutely well, right. Yeah, Dick, go ahead. Well, even with their negatives, I would rather deal with them than Saudi Arabia, and obviously they decided this week they don't want to deal with us. Right, right, exactly. And so lots lots of tough decisions as the White House made. I think, Dick, your point is very well taken that none of this is easy. None of this is easy, and we deal with the world that we're given, and the president has done that and made this arrangement. And we have seven Americans now back in our land as a result of this grant of clemency uh, to these two Venezuelans who are presumably now back in Venezuela. Mark, you're also on the line this morning. Uh, We appreciate your phone call and your comment as well. Yeah, it's it's a little amusing to me with Ron Johnson with his law and order, um, what he's voiced on now for law and order, that he chose to have some deputy sheriffs violate the law by appearing in their uniform in their commercials, because if I'm not mistaken, that is a violation of the Hatch Act. Um, that uh, I tried you know, checking it out, and it was a little... But I do not think they're supposed to be in uniform, you know, saying I'm for Ron Johnson, and, and uh, that... Uh, and, Correct me if I'm wrong. But, uh and, 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 and right, your observation about representations made, you know, a lot of folks looking at the kinds of things that are, are part of our political ads these days, especially the visual ones that plainly convey authority by virtue of, of wearing, uh, wearing official uh, uh, garments and, and uh, other, other uh, uh, aspects of your, your official engagement. A lot of criticism out there for former military folks, likewise, wearing uh, their former uh, garb, if you will, from the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and so 
forth, and representing, uh, supposedly uh, indicating that people should vote for them because of their prior prior involvement. So all those things, uh, matters of concern, uh, matters of focus, and uh, again, perhaps not focusing on the merits of those candidacies as much as the past. And so a uh, good point made there as well. We're chatting this morning, and in addition to taking your calls, as always, we appreciate those comments, uh, those observations. We're chatting this morning also about pardons, pardons uh, granted this past week by the president. The second, the second large package of pardons issued by President Biden, as I indicated right before our two good callers this morning, with respect to people who are convicted in federal court, a significant aspect in federal court for marijuana possession. This past Thursday, President Biden, uh, Biden uh, pursuant to the Constitution of the United States of America, uh, issued pardons with respect to people convicted of marijuana possession, said his administration would review whether marijuana should remain a Schedule One drug like heroin and LSD, saying that that makes no sense. So lots of things to, to look at there. The pardons that he granted, again, only for those uh, for uh, 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 prosecutions in the federal system, about 6,500 people altogether convicted in the past of the federal charges of simple possession of marijuana between 1992 and 2001. We'll tell you more about those, the aspects of those particular pardons right after the break right here on WAUK Radio. We are back, and in our final moments of this first hour on Morning Cannolis, talking about law and justice and government in America, we're discussing, once again, pardons in America. We talked before the break about this package of pardons uh, issued with respect to two Venezuelans in our federal prison. They were exchanged for seven Americans who are now back home, back home in connection with our deal, our arrangement with the Madero government in Venezuela. The president exercising his his authority, his power under Article 2 of the Constitution to do just that, and in this second package of pardons issued just on Thursday, again, to the delight of many people and to the criticism of others, as these pardons always do, issuing a pardon that's affecting about 6,500 people who were previously convicted of federal charges of simple possession of marijuana, the dates of those convictions between 1992 and 2021. And beyond those folks, who, again, have been subject to federal criminal judgments during that period of time. Thousands more who were also convicted of possession of marijuana in the District of Columbia, also because of the specific kind of authority the federal government has with respect to the D.C. area. Uh, those all a part of the announcement by the President of the United States of America just this past week, pardoning those and significant observations about that. One, of course, is that not all of those 6,500 people People are still in federal prison, many of them because of the nature of their offense conduct, the low-level nature of their involvement in drug possession, very, very likely, very likely not in prison, but nonetheless subject to oversight, subject to supervision by federal supervisory officers. Their sentences, their charges, subject to these pardons again, removal from the official records of the district courts around the country. Uh, another significant, significant observation: this court applies, of course, applies only to federal prisoners, federal convicts, convicts who have been uh, subject to these criminal judgments for marijuana possession. It does not apply. It does not apply to individuals, men and women, who have been subject to criminal process prosecution for possession in the state systems, including right here in Wisconsin. And so an awful lot of people uh, talking about that and saying, well, this is a good first start in terms of addressing this long festering issue. Nonetheless, uh, state authorities have got to address this as well. Uh, only 92 people were sentenced on federal marijuana uh, possession charges in 2017, which again indicates that in the federal system, the number of people is not that great. Um, about uh, 30,000 drug convictions overall, according to the U.S. 
U.S. Sentencing Commission, 92 people in 2017. An awful lot of folks out there looking at this saying that um, crime, this kind of possession of marijuana crime, uh, prosecuted almost entirely by the state's and the federal government tends to more commonly, um, as I know from my own past, to prosecute marijuana trafficking crimes. And people are involved in actual conspiracies to move and distribute uh, the drug. Beyond that, beyond that, as I said at the outset, this raises this larger issue, that is the pardons issued this past week, about what we do generally with marijuana in America. There is undeniably an initiative in the United States Congress, spearheaded by some of our representatives, Representatives in Congress on both sides of the political aisle to render marijuana possession and remove marijuana uh, from the Schedule One controlled substance list that basically would one day when, would one day legalize marijuana federally. As we know, in many states, about twenty altogether throughout the United States of America, individual states have already gone down that road. Many of them, uh, those and others, have also legalized the medical use of marijuana for those people who get some benefit from the medical use of it in addressing their particular health challenges. And so that is happening at the state system, in the federal system, notwithstanding, notwithstanding the fact that the president this past week did issue these pardons with respect to about 6,500 people, thousands more in the District of Columbia. Notwithstanding that major action by our current president, the reality is that the federal government still does a prosecute for marijuana trafficking. It is still a Schedule One controlled substance, and it's only when, at some point down the road, that the Congress uh, changes the law, legislation to accomplish that, that this will no longer be a federal offense. Again, that will not impact the state legislation. Uh, that is still a matter for state review and for consideration by state legislatures in determining what they may do with respect to marijuana. Uh, the final comment I will make about this this also a part of the general civil rights and human rights and human focus on all of this is undeniably, as the president said, uh, this makes no sense. That is the, the identification of individuals who are involved in simple possession of marijuana. We know, we know from reliable statistics that these kinds of prosecutions um, inordinately impact people of color in America. And again, another reason for doing just what the president has done, beginning to send that message to not only the 6,500 or more people that their offenses are effectively, if not forgiven in the legal sense of the word, that they should no longer be saddled with the various burdens of having these convictions with them. Also recognizing that this is an issue that inordinately affects people of color in America and that beyond it being a simple law enforcement issue, it is also an issue of race. And that if we are to one day achieve uh, true justice in America, promote the rule of law in our courts, outside of our courts, this is one way in which we can ensure that all people, regardless of color, other immutable characteristics, are not subject to these kinds of laws that place them in prison for long periods of time or even short periods of time, again, when some of those prosecutions uh, end up affecting dramatically our populations of color, ensuring that this kind of behavior... Uh, uh, well, regardless of what you may think of marijuana use as a medical matter, as a health matter, uh, not a matter for criminal prosecution, a matter, if you will, for health care, uh, for personal decision making, for discretion and judgment by individuals in our states and throughout our nation. The president, once again, this past week, sending that signal, doing what he can do to address the issue of marijuana possession in our federal system, again, looking forward to the time when our state authorities begin in greater numbers to follow that same practice down the road. As I said, marijuana already fully legal in about 20 states. Many others have relaxed criminal penalties. And according to many authorities out there, uh, those laws also accomplish better things when it comes to equity and fairness and decency with respect to the management and, and the responses of conduct by people of color. We look forward to that down 
down the road. We also look forward in our second hour here to our return to the United States Supreme Court, our return to the fact that this is the first week of the new term of the United States Supreme Court. We're going to go back and talk about what the Supreme Court did this past week and then talk more about many of the important cases on its docket in the coming term. Stay with us for the second hour here on WAUK Radio, The Shaw, in downtown Waukesha. Welcome. Grab your favorite morning beverage and join us for Morning Cannolis with Jim Santel. You don't know me, but I'm your brother. Sampling the news desserts of the week, here is your host, Jim Santel. This is our second hour coming to you from the studios of WAUK Radio right here in downtown Waukesha. My name is Jim Santel. We're chatting this hour about the United States Supreme Court. What is on its docket from this past week? What is going to be in its attention in the coming weeks and months leading up to some very important decisions likely in May and June, maybe even in July of 2023? We're going to continue our discussion begun last week about some of those very significant cases. What do we take away from the oral arguments of this past week? And what kinds of things should we anticipate from the nine justices of the Supreme Court in the coming weeks? Before we get to that, we are celebrating here in Waukesha, not only this beautiful day in the state of Wisconsin in this great city, but also also this wonderful opportunity for all of you to come to Waukesha, the Waukesha Unlocked program. Doors open to many municipal businesses and other places of history and operation, architecture, community, including right here at the studios of WAUK Radio. We're located at 217 Wisconsin Avenue, 540 AM, 101 FM. As you know, the Shaw very very, very clearly indicated on our front windows here, broadcasting right off of the street area. We welcome your visitors beginning right now and until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. My colleague and sometimes partner as well, uh, Don Brown, is still in the studio here, inviting you to come in and be a part of our operation here this morning. Otherwise, take part in all that Waukesha has to offer this morning, beginning right now, continuing for the next six hours continuing again tomorrow when not only throughout Waukesha many opportunities to visit and explore this wonderful place in America in the state of Wisconsin but also an opportunity for live broadcasting continue on Sunday morning tomorrow. Mike Crute back in the station tomorrow to talk with you again about the important issues of this day. Waukesha Unlocked. Participate in it. A wonderful opportunity to explore your city. Explore a city you haven't been in before and come and discuss Discover all the wonderful things about America right here in Waukesha, 217 Wisconsin Avenue. Join us at any time in the next several hours. I am joined right here in the studio by my producer, Calvin. We're also taking your phone calls throughout the remainder of this hour at 844-967-2789, 844-967-2789. We're devoting the rest of this hour to the United States Supreme Court, what it has done, what we are going to look forward to it taking up in this present 2022-2023 term as its new review of cases gets underway. In the coming weeks, coming Saturday mornings here on, on Morning Cannolis, we're going to be taking up some of those cases. We probably will not finish with all of them this morning. Certainly will not do that. But as those cases come to the attention of the Supreme Court, we're going to be talking about the arguments had and the new cases, the new cases getting on the docket. Up to this point in the Supreme Court's history of this term, it has granted certiorari, granted a writ of certiorari in about 37, 38 
28 different cases. That's a fancy way. That's the legal way. That's the Supreme Court way of saying we're going to review these cases from lower courts, lower federal courts, most typically appeals courts. Thus, the kind of thing that the President of the United States of America has pursued to the Supreme Court, coming out of the 11th Circuit, coming out of the District Court in South Florida. Other cases out of the federal courts, they will grant certiorari, which is a fancy way, once again, of saying, give to the Supreme Court the records of the lower court. We're going to review what has happened. We're going to determine whether or not the lower court judgments make sense, legally, factually, in terms of promoting the rule of law. They've done that with respect to about 37, 38 cases up to this point. Likely they'll add more to that but between now and the end of the term. Most often, the Supreme Court issues somewhere between 60 and 70 cases every term. They were pretty much on track for that in the past term and now concluded. And they will probably do the same. So we anticipate many more cases on its docket in the weeks and the months yet to come in this particular term. And among those cases, among those cases coming out of the federal courts, also coming out of the state courts as well. The Constitution of the United States of America, as you know, also contemplates that petitions for review from the highest courts in the states can also be subject to review by the United States Supreme Court. And then our founding fathers also carved out some areas for original jurisdiction, first time before the United States Supreme Court in a number of cases is also identified in Article 3 of the United States Constitution. Today, today and in future shows, we're continuing our discussion about some of those cases right now on the docket of the United States Supreme Court and along the way, throughout this hour and in the future, taking your phone calls at 844-967-2789. Let's revisit, even if only briefly, a couple of the cases we talked about last week that were in fact on the docket of the appellate arguments before the United States Supreme Court on Monday and Tuesday of this week. The first time we saw this particular configuration of the new court, the latest, newest Supreme Court Justice Ketanji Brown-Jackson, nominated by President Biden, confirmed by the Senate earlier this year, taking her spot on the bench of the United States Supreme Court on Capitol Hill, noting as well that the Supreme Court Chief Justice, his name is John Roberts, now began to permit visitors to the Supreme Court, not throughout the building as they have in the past, but two arguments of the United States Supreme Court. You can now stand in line and wait to go in and actually watch these arguments as they are scheduled and see the Supreme Court justices in action as they talk about these cases, quiz lawyers who are presenting their cases, talk about the merits and demerits, and perhaps most interestingly, talk among themselves through questions, through comments about their particular views on the cases before them. It is fascinating. It is the best example of civics on display in America. Strongly commend it to all of you if you have not already done that. Do it again if you have already done it at some point in your life. Again, all of those arguments are also um, visible, if you will. They're, they're subject to your review, not only by reporting by our major media outlets, but also you can hear them live and you can hear them recorded. There are full recordings also accessible on the Supreme Court website. You can pull that up as those arguments are underway, as you could this past week. And even today, in this moment, you can pull up the oral arguments, everything that was said by the justices, said by the attorneys advocating for various positions. Those are online, and you can hear our government, our third branch of government, in action on a regular basis as they continue their work on Capitol Hill in the Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C. in 2022 and into 2022. This past week, two cases among several, among several that warrant special attention. We talked about them briefly last week. I want to follow up just because it's significant that the Supreme Court had serious argument about the merits and demerits of these cases. The first one uh, called Sackett versus EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. You may recall from our discussion last week that we've got the Sacketts who live in Idaho, and they're planning to build and began to build a home near a place called Priest Lake Idaho, and they began the construction by dumping some sand and gravel into a wetlands area on which they live. They've got property rights to those areas, and the EPA came along and said, you can't do that. That is in violation of the Clean Water Act. 
legislation that prevents dumping of those kinds of materials into the waters uh, as a way of keeping them safe and clean and pure and clear for the future. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in this dispute between the EPA and the Hackett's about whether or not, Sackett's rather, whether they could go ahead or not, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals way out on the West Coast said, yes, indeed, the EPA does have the right to stop the Hackett's from doing this particular kind of construction and stop that halting and said that the There is a significant nexus between what the Sackets were doing, dumping these materials into these waterways, these channels, and those waterways ultimately getting into Priest Lake, perhaps other large areas. Those are wetlands covered by the, the Clean Water Act. They are, may not be navigable waters, but they're waters that affect navigable waters under the language of the EPA. And sure enough, during the course of the oral argument of this past Monday, the first argument, the first argument out of the block by the United States Supreme Court, there is contest, obviously, between the Sacketts and the EPA about what to do in this case. And the Supreme Court did have argument about that, exchanging views. Katanji Brown-Jackson, among all the others, both in the left, the right, the conservatives, the liberals, to the extent that those labels are significant at all, disputing what the Clean Clean Water Act does in fact mean. Should it in fact be narrowed to those those waterways that are purely navigable, large waterways, that those are the only ones that should be subject to control by the EPA, or should, or should, as the EPA maintains, if you dump things into tributaries and smaller rivers, should those also be subject to EPA oversight and injunction or stopping you from doing that as a way of keeping our waterways clean and pure for future generations? The Supreme Court going to be addressing this issue probably in a major case in May, June, or July of next year, telling us the extent to which this particular environmental piece of legislation is significant, is important in the enforcement of our environmental laws in our nation. A huge controversy, a huge environmental case coming out of the United States Supreme Court. And you can listen once again to that oral argument by going online during this hour, during future hours as well, uh, off of the United States Supreme Court. We're also, as you know, entertaining by the Supreme Court some other major, major pieces of legislation by our state courts and by our federal courts as well. We talked last week about another major case, which was the subject of oral argument on Tuesday of this week, that case Merrill versus Milligan. Merrill versus Milligan, a gerrymandering case coming out of the state of Alabama and determining whether or not the new congressional lines that were drawn by the state of Alabama disenfranchise the 28% black population in that state. They issued a revised districting plan that would permit only about one of the seven districts to be majority black. And the question is whether or not that kind of redistricting is in fact in violation of the Voting Rights Act. Court of Appeals said it was and sent this back back to the legislature to redo its work. The state of Alabama took it to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court's now figuring out what the law is, what the standards should be in this kind of case. A huge case when it comes to the issue of racial gerrymandering in America. What does that mean under the Voting Rights Act? Can you enforce this? And what will the Supreme Court tell us in a case called Merrill v. Milligan? Merrill v. Milligan, huge case. When we come back right after the break, we're going to talk more about elections in America, another major case before the United States Supreme Court. We are back. This is Morning Cannolis. My name is Jim Santel. We're spending the rest of this hour and, yes, indeed, future hours right here on Morning Cannolis talking about our United States Supreme Court. Why? Because the decisions that they make, as we understood, we learned in a very significant way, the decisions that this body makes, this third branch of government, affect all of us dramatically. We recall well, recall well many of the major decisions of the past term in the areas of privacy rights, abortion, in the area of violence in America, in the area of government 
gun rights, a case called Bruin. In the area of the environment, a case in which the United States Supreme Court found that the EPA could not, in fact, issue rules that limit the amount of greenhouse gases that companies can send into our air under the Clean Air Act. And so, all of those cases, very significant judgments, rulings about how our world and our nation works. No difference this coming term, the term we are presently in. We talked before the break about these two major cases having to do with the environment once again under the Clean Water Act. And then also this significant case having to do with the interpretation once again of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. What does Section 2 mean? Does, in fact, it prohibit discrimination based upon race? Racial gerrymandering. Uh, do the populations of Alabama have a right uh, to greater representation, people of color in that state? What does the Voting Rights Act really mean? In the wake of the Supreme Court in the past several years, issuing two major blows to the impact of the Voting Rights Act in a case called Shelby County, eliminating the pre-clearance provisions of that statute, and then just a couple of years ago in a case called Brnovich out of Arizona, also dramatically limiting the extent to which particular pieces of legislation will be found in violation of the act, giving legislatures great authority uh, to pass legislation that limits the capacity of Americans to come to the polls and get access to the franchise. And so, and so we've got a lot of focus again this term upon elections and upon voting. And that includes what I would offer to you is one of the most significant cases to come before the Supreme Court in our lifetime. As significant as all of those cases were in the past term, dramatic and in many ways concerning about the future of our nation, there is yet another case that is on the docket. It is perhaps much less well-known, and that is the reason for my discussion discussion of it this morning. And it is a case called Moore v. Harper. Moore v. Harper. It has not yet been scheduled for oral argument. There are other cases coming up for oral argument. We're going to chat about those later in this hour. But let's spend spend some time talking about Moore versus Harper so that we begin to think about the significance of this case and we can do some civics understanding about what may happen depending upon the Supreme Court's resolution of this very significant case, uh, this one coming out of North Carolina. North Carolina. And so where does this come from? Well, we know, we go back once again to the Constitution, and we know in that Constitution the so-called Elections Clause, the Elections Clause written by James Madison, others, George Mason, in that Constitution says this, It says the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives, in other words, the federal elected officials, for senators and representatives shall be prescribed by the legislatures thereof. Let me read that one more time. Times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives prescribed by the legislatures thereof. In other words, makes sense, right? The state legislatures make decisions about the rules and the practices, the policies by which we conduct elections in America. We know well that it is not a federal government. It's not our federal government through the Elections Commission that operates elections in the states. It's a state responsibility. Yes, it's done locally. Uh, Many of you are poll workers. Many of you are poll watchers. Hopefully all of you vote and you see that it is principally the states that administer and manage poll taking, poll working, the elections process. That is by virtue of that elections clause in the United States Constitution and gives state legislatures the capacity to prescribe rules and regulations for doing just that. The significance of that old language that has been from time to time the subject of focus is a doctrine called the independent state legislature doctrine. Sounds very legalistic, sounds difficult almost to grab around in terms of understanding it and first stating it. The independent state legislature doctrine, it is by the views of people who are much brighter than I am, much more historically sensitive, much better constitutional scholars than I will ever be. It is by all reports a fringe document. It is not in the mainstream of America. It has been out there for some time. What does it say, and why is it so very obscure, never before now taking a center stage? Because it says this, that that Elections Clause language in the Constitution not only prescribes the authority of state legislatures to act, but makes it 
exclusive, that the state legislatures are the only ones who decide things about the policies and practices by which our voting is conducted in Wisconsin, in states around the nation, that the courts, the courts have no role in this whatsoever. And that, that doctrine stands its head on 240 years of tradition and, if you will, interpretation of the Elections Clause. When this has come up in the past, the courts, including the Supreme Court, have dismissed that notion. They've said, of course, of course the courts have roles to play. We have saw this in the past, uh, recently, in the 2022 challenges. Sixty different courts took a look at whether or not the Biden presidency was real and found, yes, indeed, the election was not stolen, found that these claims that the election was subject to fraud were simply not true. The Courts always resolve cases involving procedure, practice, even in the moments of polling. We run to the courts to get rulings, to keep polls open, to address particular snafus, if you will, in the conduct of elections. The courts have always been involved in this, and that elections clause has never, ever been officially interpreted to prohibit the courts from being involved in resolving those kinds of challenges in the midst of of polling and certainly after polling as well. What does this independent state doctrine, this independent state legislature doctrine contemplate? And it contemplates that courts will no longer be involved in this. And if there are, in fact, disputes involving the process of elections, protocols, procedures, that it is not the courts to whom we would run, state courts, federal courts. It is not the state courts who are responsible for this, but rather state legislatures, the Assembly, the Senate here in the state of Wisconsin, that would vote on the practices and procedures that that would vote that would vote on who won elections. Suppose there is a contest who actually won. That would not be resolved as it has been for over two centuries by courts. It would be resolved by votes of our state legislature. And again, even as I say that out loud, it should send shivers up and down everyone's spine because of the dramatic impact that such a policy, a practice, removing the courts from this would have in our nation. Placing in the hands of our legislature, admittedly our elected legislature, the decisions about who won and effectively transplanting, if you will, your voting right, the meaning of your vote uh, in from the polling place into state legislatures. I'm going to talk more about the impact of this doctrine and how it's now before the Supreme Court right after this break. Stay with us as we talk more about this independent state legislature doctrine, the review of it in this term by our Supreme Court. We are back. This is Jim Santel's Morning Cannolis. We're talking about the United States Supreme Court. Right before the break, I was chatting about this case that I have already dubbed one of the, if not the, most important case in our lifetime before the Supreme Court, understanding fully that the Supreme Court cases of this past term have to do with privacy rights and guns and environment and many other things, hugely significant, not to diminish in any way the significance of those cases. This case, this case, Moore versus Harper, write it down. Uh, commit those names to memory. Moore versus Harper, because it goes to the very fundamental notion of who we are as a republic and how we get, how we get our elected representatives representatives, how they maintain power, how the power of the vote should be continued under our Constitution. Right before the break, chatting about this independent state legislature doctrine that would basically remove the courts from the capacity, their authority, which has lasted for 240 years under our Constitution, under state Constitution, to review things going on in our state and our federal elections as well, and significantly even to resolve things with respect to who won elections. Those under this doctrine would no longer be subject to judicial review, but state legislatures would decide how the cases, how the voting should come out by virtue of their political partisan voting in the assemblies and the state bodies around and then Senate bodies around 
our nation. Moore versus Harper. And it is before the United States Supreme Court in a case coming out of North Carolina. North Carolina had also, like Alabama, redrawn its district maps, just like we did here in Wisconsin. And eventually the, those maps came to the North Carolina Supreme Court. And the North Carolina Supreme Court, like the case um, with, we talked about in connection with um, Alabama, the North Carolina Supreme Court said, nope, this is inappropriate gerrymandering. You're disenfranchising identified populations here in North Carolina. Sent it back down to a better job. And along the way, along the way, met this argument that the North Carolina Supreme Court and other courts did not even have the capacity, the authority, the responsibility to decide the case at all because it's only legislatures that would have this role to play. That was the argument made by the North Carolina advocates. And the Supreme Court, the North Carolina Supreme Court, again, to its credit, said this, said that the notion that it's powerless to review these legislative decisions is, quote, repugnant to the sovereignty of the states, the authority of state constitutions, and the independence of state courts, and would produce absurd and dangerous consequences. It's based upon that kind of language that people all around the country previously have dismissed this independent state legislature doctrine as being ridiculous, as being fringe, as being absurd, as being not just obscure, but dangerous, as the North Carolina Supreme Court has said. Many people thought that, that was the end of it. But in fact, in fact, the United States Supreme Court has granted cert, grant certiorari, and is hearing this case not yet scheduled for oral argument, but again, the kind of thing that all Americans should tune into when, in fact, the nine justices hear this case. It's going to be argued. We know already that there are three, maybe even four justices who are at least interested in this independent state legislature doctrine as a viable theory, as a viable way of organizing government in the future. A very, very concerning development. You know that Sam Alito has said this case, this case, this is this, this Moore versus Harper case presents an exceptionally important and recurring question of constitutional law, namely the extent of a state court's authority to reject rules adopted by a state legislature for use in conducting federal elections. And that's Sam Alito saying, you know what, there's some credibility in this. There's some reason for believing that indeed these are the choices that only a legislature should make. Brett Kavanaugh, also on the court right now, said, the issue is certainly to keep arising until the court definitively resolves it, clearly makes a decision on this. And so we know from Alito, from Kavanaugh, that they have got an interest in this. And the very fact, as many people have said, the Supreme Court is looking at this independent state legislature doctrine at all and not keeping it in the dustbin, if you will, of crazy legal and judicial theories is great concer- greatly concerning. That case, again, not yet scheduled for oral argument, but coming up. And why, again, is it so important? If indeed the United States Supreme Court, and we hope it will reject this theory as it has done before, but if it does not and adopts it in some way, shape, or form, it dramatically changes the way in which voting is challenged in America, in which your vote can count when it comes to the representation that you have in your elected offices. It changes the very democracy that we have relied upon for 240 years. It is no, nothing short, nothing short of a dramatic, dramatic precision in the way that we have conducted elections for all of our national history. The importance of this cannot be overstated. Joe, you're calling in. I suspect you've got, as always, some good thoughts or comments on these and perhaps other cases before the United States Supreme Court in this term. Uh, Thanks, Jim. A really important topic, and and, uh, I really appreciate the detail that you are giving us so that we understand it more completely. Um, A couple of things. At the very beginning of the show, um, you were talking about what's ahead, and uh, it was one of those moments. uh, It came out of your mouth, and I'll tell you, it was right to the point. You said this is a case that um, is looking at who decides who wins in elections. My jaw just dropped. My jaw just dropped because... Uh, I mean, it should be voters that decide the election, not our state representatives, especially in a state like Wisconsin, gerrymandered as it is. And Republicans should understand that that kind of gerrymandering could occur on the other side, too. So it needs to be an oversight of the court. But I I wanted to get into a few more details on this. Um, Number one, I mean, it's the mere fact that you have suggested that they have chosen to look at this, um, to look at this. This is really important to understand because the court doesn't take that many cases. My understanding, it's only 
about 70 every year out of some, you know, approximately 7,000 that are presented to them. So right there, they're making a statement about, we want to look at this, meaning, to me, we think there's merit and we want to go this direction, at least some of the justices. And the second thing I'm, I wanted to, to go at at this is, what kind of, in a in a state where, for example, uh, we had Wisconsin with our fake electors, and that was Robin Voss who made sure that those state electors were able to enter the building with an armed guard um, to go in and cast their illegal uh, fake elector votes. With a state legislature like that, what kind of shenanigans do you imagine could happen in terms of our federal election votes? In such a circumstance, I mean, the, the fake electors would indicate that, that uh, the Republicans who are running our state legislature would stop really at nothing in order to uh, get the result that they'd like. Can you just do a little speculating as to if this were to go to say um, no court um, challenges are allowed for any uh, federal election, instead it is your state uh, legislature that, that decides your vote. Could you for could that state legislature, for example, say um, we're only going to have one polling place in uh, urban areas over a certain size? And uh, if they have a majority, uh, they could do that. Would that be something that they could do? Um, I, anyway, I appreciate your speculation on the kinds of shenanigans that might be um, a, a able to be used if this goes through. Thanks a lot, Jim, as always. Uh, Joe, thanks so much for your comments, and it does bring to the fore uh, the practical implications of it. They may well be shenanigans, and I think, Joe, implicit if not explicit, one of the things you said is you know, goose for the gander, right? Um, That uh, this can apply equally to Democrats and Republicans, depending upon where you are, and that's why it's not such a partisan issue. It certainly plays out that way in states like Wisconsin, could play out that way in other places around the country. Uh, Republicans in states where the Democrats in charge of state legislatures should be equally concerned about this for the very reasons, Joe, that you just identified. And yes, um, shenanigans is perhaps the parochial kind of word for it, but it is the kind of thing that has got people very, very concerned. Let me get to your first point, which is the fact that they took this at all. Again, up to now, as I said, this has been on the fringe. This has been out there like conspiracy theories and other things in America. And the fact that the United States Supreme Court would give it the legitimacy, if you will, of taking up this North Carolina case. And again, I'll repeat the name of the case, Moore versus Harper, write it down and know that it's out there. That's a very significant matter that they're attending to this at all. There are those people out there who say, well, they're taking this up as maybe Brett Kavanaugh may have been indicating just to put a a definitive end to it. The problem with that theory, Joe and others, is that uh, it really hasn't been a problem for the courts out there. It hasn't been an issue, yes, raised from time to time, but consistently shot down. And there's no no split in the circuits out there. Uh, This is not taken on a mainstream avenue. And so, Joe, your point is exactly right. The very fact that they have taken this on is troubling because they're perhaps entertaining the idea of adopting it. And again, if that is the case, uh, huge consequences, shenanigans, and more. Even the fact that it is now before the court uh, tends to lend it legitimacy. The fact that I am describing it this morning um, on this broadcast draws more attention to it than it should probably warrant. I do it because of the seriousness of the North Carolina case and the notion that everyone, Joe, you others, uh, should be advocates out there to ensure that this does not continue with the legs it apparently does have. Beyond that, when I made the comment at the start of our show this morning that it decided its result and uh, a, a, a decision about who decides who wins, it could be nothing short of that. That if indeed there is a contest about who won the election. Again, we, we saw that in 2020. We continue to see that on a regular basis as people appropriately say, you know what, I think the election was mine and not yours. The notion that that would go to the state legislator to decide who we send to Congress, um, that is anathema to what our basic fundamental principles are. We should do that based upon what? Math, arithmetic, right? Counting. And that's the way it's always been. The notion that you could, in fact, get a purely political decision 
a vote on who wins. What is the long-term consequence that, of that? Again, not only the concern about the future of the republic more broadly, but, but along the way to that horrific result, um, polling becomes unimportant. If we regard polling and voting as being a thing that can be overruled by a state legislature, why do it at all? And that's the horrific, horrific specter that's out there by this, and that's the kind of what, Joe, you described as shenanigans, described as very abuse, if you will, of authorities, again, could be by Democratic, could be by Republican legislatures, empowered to do something the courts have always done in the past. Appreciate that call, uh, Joe. Gene, you're also on the phone this morning from Eau Claire. Thanks so much for calling in this morning to WAUK Radio. Thank you so much for, for these educational sessions. Oh, I just want to bring up one real quick thing, and then I have a question. Um, people can also watch, you know, PBS um, on YouTube live, and they carry the courts, too, and they also have them recorded, so you can go in and watch later. I've been um, utilizing YouTube and um, PBS Live. They'll, they'll cover it. Um, anyway, um, this case being brought to the Supreme Court, now, these were decided by higher courts in the states. Um, they were already decided by the higher courts in those two states, right? Absolutely. Um, right. North Carolina, okay. Alabama, so, absolutely. Yes, yes. And so people in their own states have a legal recourse when things aren't running appropriately or legally or whatever. So they're taking the decisions from those individual states where these people are concerned of these rights being violated and then putting it to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court is now saying, might say, well, you know, you have no recourse, people. You know, you have no recourse. Uh, it, it is a very frightening thing. And thank you so much for covering this. Uh, what can we do as citizens? Is there anything that we can do as citizens, um, you know, to, to speak back, speak out, or whatever? Because this is a travesty. And, and I've been independent my entire life. I've never belonged to a political party. And to me, this is just, this is lunacy. And thank you. For the education, and please let us know if there's anything that we can do right away. Absolutely, Jane. And again, appreciate the comment um, and great concern about what's going on here in these cases. Right to an appeal, obviously, to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has the capacity to do these kinds of things. But the issues are important. And so right after the break, Jane, I'm going to take up your question about what you can do in connection with these pending cases. Specifically, this case coming in North Carolina. What can you do? Jean, Joe, others who've called in this morning. What kinds of things can you do in anticipation of the argument and anticipation Participation of a ruling as Americans. We're going to talk about that right after this final break on Morning Cannolis. Final minutes here on Morning Cannolis on this Saturday, October 8th. Thanks so much for joining me here in our discussion about Supreme Court cases. Before the break, we were chatting about this case called Moore versus Harper. Write it down. Talk to your family about it. Talk to your friends about it, your co-workers about it in those off-work hours. Tell them about the serious implications of Moore versus Harper when it comes to the future of our democracy. And right before the break, we were chatting about the things that Americans can do right now as this is before the Supreme Court, and as it always is, uh, this is a part of civics understanding. The reason for our discussing it on Morning Cannolis and the other cases before the Supreme Court is simply um, education, to ensure that people understand what our government is doing, what kinds of things with respect to Moore versus Harper and these other cases can, in fact, you do. Um, Judges are, in fact, people who live in the world, and they do have addresses, and yes, indeed, I'm sufficiently old school to advocate for being in touch with them. Uh, send them letters and describe in a dispassionate but very serious and compelling way your view about the future of democracy. Write justices of the United States Supreme Court a letter. Uh, advocate with your congressional representatives about the importance
importance of this. Talk to your elected leaders, local, state, and federal, about the significance of this case coming up, not because they can directly influence and have a direct decision-making authority when it comes to how this case is resolved, but because through greater notoriety and greater understanding, the Supreme Court itself, the members of that court, can have a greater appreciation for what America thinks and does not think about this very important case. So advocacy, as always, in the civics area, beyond that, beyond that, education, talking, uh, engagement, and further understanding. This case, Moore versus Harper, does not have the attractiveness of the one-word bumper sticker type approach, uh, civil rights and, and, and other things that are hugely compelling. Uh, it takes a little bit more understanding to understand where it comes from, the elections clause, uh, the articles of the Constitution, how this applies coming out of North Carolina. But that doesn't mean it's not serious. And so important for schools to take this up, not in a partisan way, not introducing polit- politics into our schools, but discussing as a matter of social studies and of civic what our Supreme Court is looking at today, having more engagement on a regular basis, understanding Moore versus Harper, and continuing the discussion. And yes, and yes, as our previous caller indicated, looking at things like PBS does a wonderful job of exploring the ins and outs of these cases. NPR, other wonderful media outlets, likewise, drawing attention to this case and others. And we'll chat about it more once the Supreme Court schedules an oral argument on it and dice and slice and pursue with great specificity what the Supreme Court justices say about this case when it is before them sometime perhaps later this year, more likely into 2023. In the last few moments, let me tease two other cases also coming up before the Supreme Court this coming week. Monday, of course, is a legal holiday, a federal holiday, but on Tuesday, October 11th, and Wednesday, October 12th, Supreme Court back in action once again. If you happen to be there in Washington, D.C., go there, stand in line, and watch the Supreme Court. Otherwise, tune in and listen to the arguments in at least two cases. One of them is called National Pork Producers versus Ross, a pork case having to do with our Commerce Clause. That's Tuesday, October 11th. And then Wednesday, October 12th, again, equally significant, but also somewhat light in terms of the overall substance of what we're talking about this morning. A case involving Andy Warhol and Prince, believe it or not, having to do with our copyright laws. The first of these on Tuesday, October 11th, National Pork Producers Producers versus Ross. 2018 California voters enacted something called Proposition 12. It banned the sale of pork produced from hogs confined in a manner uh, that state law in the state of California considered inhumane, caring for the hogs there. Trade organizers representing the economic and the commercial interests of the pork industry objected, arguing that the Constitution protects them uh, against state laws that burden another commerce uh, pursuit in other states. Uh, The appeals court, the Ninth Circuit, rejected that position and said that laws that increase compliance costs without more, do not constitute a significant burden on interstate commerce. And so now before the Supreme Court, in a case called National Pork Producers versus Ross, to be argued this coming Tuesday, this coming Tuesday in the morning, the Supreme Court determining whether or not the state of California can impose these regulations uh, restricting the sale of pork inside its borders with respect to pork products that are produced outside its borders that may have been the result of inhumane main treatment of hogs. Follow all that? A lot of it has to do with interstate commerce. And yes, we may smile knowingly that this is about pigs and it's about pork and it's about the things that we we fry up in our pans and on our grills. But the reality is it's a very significant case having to do with interstate commerce, the capacity of a particular state arguably, to impact interstate commerce. Does California have that right under the Constitution? Uh, The Biden administration, interestingly, is siding with the pork producers, but on a very narrow basis that the California law is unconstitutional because, as the Biden briefs have said, it's aimed at cruelty to animals that occurs entirely outside of California, has no impact within California. So they take a a side in favor of the pork producers, uh, not so much on the interstate commerce issue, 
issue, but on the inhumanity issue with respect to inhumane treatment of the pigs and the pork um, as pigs are being slaughtered out of state. So Tuesday, October 11th, a pork case, but more significantly, elevating this to something more important, interstate commerce. Does the federal government, are they the only ones that can regulate interstate commerce, as the Constitution says, or do states have this capacity to make decisions about the kinds of products inside its own borders? We'll chat more about that next week as well. Know that there are some precedents out there in the states of Vermont and Minnesota that do these kinds of things uh, that, again, have an impact upon products produced in other states that nonetheless are sold inside those particular states. The case, once again, um, in this interstate commerce area, National Pork Producers versus Ross. And second, and second, on Wednesday the 12th, this coming Wednesday, Andy Warhol and Prince are in front of the United States Supreme Court. Yes, that's right. Andy Warhol and Prince having to do with a copyright issue. Andy Warhol, of course, this famous pop culture artist, uh, used a photograph of the pop musician Prince uh, way back in 1984. He was creating some images for a, an article in Vanity Fair. He created these images based upon a photograph that was taken by a woman named Lynn Goldsmith. Uh, she eventually sued, and the question is whether or not Andy Warhol and his foundation have the right to use that under copyright laws. This coming Wednesday, the court taking a look at all that. We'll be back again next week as well to talk about all this and more. Join us then for Morning Cannolis, more on the Supreme Court, more about justice, law, and government in America. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day in Wisconsin, throughout the United States of America. Be well, be safe, everybody.